You have to admit it's been great this morning. Amen. There's something about those kids. Yeah, give the kids another hand. Mm. What I'm amazed at is how fast they learn the songs. They put us all, us adults, all to shame. I mean, they hear it one time and they know it. I hear it once a day for a year and still don't know it, you know. Hey, I'm glad you're here. I'm, I'm glad you're back. You know, over the last uh, six, seven weeks, we've been talking about the importance of the family. And there's no greater visual than to see all the kids here. Every one of these kids comes from different families and they're all different, different personalities, different abilities. All of that fits into the context of this thing called family. Well, today I want us to finish up the series on the family and, and we're going to talk about marriage. We're going to talk about what is it that makes marriage so fulfilling? Or for others, what is it that's preventing you from being satisfied in the context of your marriage? What is it that we need to know so we can move forward and experience what God has created? Uh, you, you realize that marriage is God's idea? You knew that, right? In fact, let me show you what I'm talking about. There's a couple of verses of scripture that, that really you need to go keep going back and forth, uh, reading, rereading again, in order that you don't forget what God intends. Uh, for example, Genesis chapter 1, the very first book of the Bible, chapter 2, it's a, it's a recap of day 6 of creation. And God has created uh, all the animals, he's created everything, and now he's created man in his own image. And then, then it brings us to this passage in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. It says, then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. Now that's God who's saying that. And if God says it, there must be some truth to that. He says, and I, because I know that's the case, I will make him a helper suitable for him. That helper suitable, uh, suitable is, a, is a word in the Hebrew language that talks about something that totally, permanently complements. God's saying, it's not good for you to do life by yourself, so I'm going to create another person that I intend for you to become one with. That's, that's part of God's plan. He says, it's not good for you to be alone, so let me create for you one that will perfectly complement you. Now, it, Jesus takes it one step further. I mean, there's, there's so much more there. But if you fast forward to the New Testament, the book of Mark, chapter 10, Jesus is, is being confronted by the religious leaders of the day, and they're trying to get him to trip up and say something that he'll regret, get people to stop believing in Jesus. So they're saying, Jesus, let's talk about marriage right now. What do you think about divorce? And they're trying, to, they're trying to get Jesus to say what he doesn't want to say, which would violate the scriptures. So here's how Jesus responds. Mark 10, verse 6. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. I mean, that's how it has been from the very beginning. God says, I am creating a man named Adam. I'm going to create a woman named Eve who will totally complement him. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. Now stop right there for a minute and ask yourself this question. Who's he talking about here? I thought he was talking about Adam and Eve. But now he's talking about somebody who has to leave father and mother. Who was Adam's father? Who was Eve's father and mother? They didn't have one. That's the point. Jesus is saying, I want to lay out for you what I think marriage is. He says, me and the Father are one. And so he's saying, I want you to know that there are two different people that I've, I've created for each other. He says, and I want them to come together. And I want them to become one. Listen how it goes on. It says, and for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh, so that they are no longer two, but one flesh. The word one flesh in the Hebrew language is also a word that describes the totalness of the person. So when he says one flesh, it means the physical dimension of marriage, which is a wonderful gift from God. But he also means the oneness of mind, the oneness of heart, the oneness of purpose. He says, I want a couple to come together and be one. That's, but he uses the term one flesh to describe that. And then he finally finishes up in verse 9 and he says, now because that's my plan... My plan is for this woman and this man to come together. They come from different families with a different set of values, different experiences and all that, but for a reason, because that's, that that that's what enables them to complement each other. He says, I, I want all that to take place. I want you to get that. Understand that this isn't an accidental encounter that these two had. They were made for each other. Therefore, num verse 9, what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. He's saying divorce should not even be an option. 
He says, they're trying to get him to say, divorce is okay for anybody that's having a bad time in marriage, which is about the way they practiced it at that time. And so this is Jesus' way of saying, look, you forget that I'm the one that invented marriage. I'm the one that created Adam. I'm the one that created Eve for Adam. I've created you, and I've created somebody for you. So because of that, you don't want to run away from that. Now, I want us to spend more time talking about what those expectations were and, and talk about the, the secrets that's, that enable your marriage to be satisfying. But before we do that, I think it would be helpful to refer to the experts. Experts that are between the ages of six years old and 10 years old. How do they view marriage? And you know the way they view marriage is what they've picked up from their parents or others. So let me just give you a few of these. Alan, age 10, was asked, how do you decide who to marry? He says, you got to find someone who likes the same stuff. Like, if you like sports, she should like it that you like sports. And she should keep the chips and dip coming. <laughs> where, did she, where did he get that idea? <laughs> Kirsten, age 10, says, no person really decides what they, before they grow up who they're going to marry. God decides it all the way before, and you just find out later who you're stuck with. Camille, age 10, was asked the question, what is the right age to get married? She says, 23 is the best age because you know the person forever by then. <laughs> Only a child could say. How about, um, they were asked the question, how can a stranger tell if two people are married? Well, Eddie, age 6, says, married people you usually look happy to talk to other people. <laughs> and Derek, age 8, said, you might have to guess based on whether they seem to be yelling at the same kids. How about this one? What do you think your mom and dad have in common? Lori, age eight, says, well, both don't want no more kids. <laughs> Lynette, age 10, says, dates are for having fun, and people should use them to get to know each other. Even boys have something to say if you listen long enough. <laughs> wow. All right, here's another question. When is it OK to kiss someone? Pam, age seven, says, when they're rich. <laughs> Where do they get that, I wonder? Kurt, age seven, says, the law says you have to be 18, so I wouldn't want to mess with that. <laughs> and Howard, age eight, says, the rule goes like this. If you kiss someone, then you should marry them and have kids with them. It's the right thing to do. <laughs> or how about this? Is it better to be single or married? Anita, age nine, says, it's better for girls to be single, but not for boys. Boys need someone to clean up after them. <laughs> wow. How about, I got a couple more. Kirsten, age 10, said, single is better for the simple reason that I wouldn't want to change no diapers. Of course, if I did get married, I'd just phone my mother and have her come over for some coffee and diaper changing. <laughs> See, they get it. I mean, somehow, it's a twisted, distorted view. Okay, a couple more. How would, the, how would the world be different if people didn't get married? Roberta, age 7, says, you can be sure of one thing the boys would come chasing after us just the same as they do now. <laughs> and then the last one. How would you make a marriage work? Ricky, age 10, says, tell your wife that she looks pretty even if she looks like a truck. Oh <laughs> wow. Now, listen. <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> those are the experts. <laughs> And, and what they're, they're not shooting straight with us. They're just saying what they felt, what they seemed to, you know, this is what they're catching. But we need to know that one of the reasons why marriage seems so difficult at times is because we have ideas like that. And we picked them up somewhere and nobody was there to help us and help correct us. What we need to do is we need to jump into God's word and say, God, what is this marriage thing all about? How does it work? What, what am I supposed to do here? And that's what I want to show you today. And, and there's so much more I could share today even, but I limited it to seven secrets just because that's less than eight, and I, it'd make you feel a little bit better there. But, uh, but I want us to look at them, and, and you're going to find that the passages are very practical. They're very easy to apply because God wanted to make sure we didn't, get, we didn't miss this. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Now, I haven't mentioned, if you haven't gotten your note sheet, you can still pull it out now because you've got a lot of blanks there to fill out. Number one, the first secret of a satisfying marriage is this. Talk to each other. Talk to each other. I mean, that's lacking in so many relationships. They don't talk with each other. I mean, this is, you know, when we're talking about the one flesh concept, 
You, there's no way to achieve a one flesh relationship without communication. I mean, one flesh is meant to, you know, you're to interact with your brains, your ideas and all that stuff. How do you get that across? Communication. How about your heart? Do you know how you feel about certain things? They know how they feel about some things. How can you become one flesh? When you start talking, when you start communicating, it, that the emotions come out that way. That's what he's talking about here. He says you should know that you need to talk, but the question we, we need to answer, though, is what does that look like? What kind of talk? Because that's where most of the problems come in. We do talk, we just say the wrong things. Or we say it with the wrong attitude. Or, well, we, we do a lot of things. So let me just show you what the scripture says here. Ephesians 4.29. Now ask yourself this question. Do I apply this verse to my marriage? When it comes to communication. It says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth but only such a word as is good for edification. Edification just simply means to build up, to make stronger. So when you're communicating to your spouse, that's your goal. You're trying to help them become stronger. You're trying to lift them up and encourage them. And then it goes on. But only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment. It means that the, the, the words are appropriate now. You know, Jesus said, when you're speaking the truth, you want to speak it with love. Why would he say that? Because if you don't have love, your, te your tendency is to tear down people rather than lift them up. That's what we're talking about. By, by, you, by, by listening to the time signals, there's the right time to say things and there's the wrong time to say things. It may be true, but if it's the wrong time, then you haven't let it become an unwholesome word that edifies. And then it ends, this verse ends and says, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. The whole purpose of you talking in a way that God wants you to talk to your spouse is so that they receive grace. Now, what is grace? I've said this many, many times. The Bible says, defines grace as the desire to do what God wants and the ability to do what God wants. That's grace. So when it comes to your marriage, you're wondering, how can I ever love them like I should love them or like I used to love them? God says, you need some grace. Because my, my will for you is that you love each other unconditionally. See, you need grace. And that grace is not only going to make you feel like you love them, the grace is going to propel you forward and enable you to actually love them. It's not, a, it's not for show. This is so important. How about, how about Colossians chapter 4, verse 6? Let your speech always be, what's the word? Gracious. Now, come on. Every time you speak to your spouse, it's graciously, isn't it? Don't look at your spouse right now. She will glare at you. you know. this, the Bible's very clear here. He says, I, I'm concerned about your attitude when you're talking to, your, to each other. I created you for each other to compliment each other, but, but you're going to destroy that which I've created you for by just not be, tempering your vocabulary and the things that you say, by just not saying what needs to be said at the right time, but rather just saying it to get it off your chest. How about another one? Proverbs 15, verse 1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I mean, you can't say it any clearer than this. The big deal is this, that your spouse, as gifted as she is, as gifted as he is, they still can't read your mind. So you need to talk. And you need to share. And you know what? Our languages are different too. I mean, he speaks a different language than she does. And, and I'm saying not necessarily, I'm not talking about English, Greek, whatever. I'm talking about just the way we communicate. Like when I come home, the first thing my wife always asks me is this, how'd your day go? I'm in the habit of summing everything up. So I always have a two or three answer, two or three word answer. Oh, it went fine. It was good. But that's not the answer she wanted. And that's not really the question she was asking. She wants to know what kind of difference has it today made in your life since you left this house. I wasn't there to help protect you. I wasn't there to encourage you. I just want to know what, what would you do? And, and as a matter of fact, the different personality types are asking different questions too. My wife, she doesn't really care what I did. She wants to know who I saw and who I spent time with and who, who did I get with. And she's always asking the word who. Whereas somebody who's more phlegmatic is going to ask the question why. Why, why do you ask that? Why did you do that? What's behind that? Or uh, uh, somebody who's a high choleric, somebody who's a strong leader, they don't care about all that stuff. That's all fuzzy stuff. The, the choleric is always asking the question, what? Just give me the bottom line. Just tell me what you want and I'll get it done. Don't mess, don't mess with me about the other things. But, but, but I'm just telling you, when you speak the language of your personality, it changes the way that you're going to come back and respond. 
See, I don't just keep a list of things on my, uh, of what I did during the day. On occasion, I don't do it all the time, but sometimes I'll literally, before I leave the office, I pull out a piece of paper and I jot it down, everything I can remember that I did that day, just so that when I go home and Cindy says, what'd you do today? Oh, well, let me pull this out. <laughs> Ta-da, you know, and I'm answering her question. But I'm doing it because I really want her to know, and if you leave it to just me, I'm not going to think of those things. So that's why I, I always ask my wife, please just ask questions, because if you ask, then I'll know what, I, what you're looking for, and I know how to answer. But that's what, that's what we're talking about here. Communication, talking. Don't assume they know, every, know it all, even though they might act like they know it all. They don't. And so there needs to be that, that communication. Now, number two, the second secret. Choose to care about what concerns your spouse. Choose to care about what your spouse cares about. I mean, sometimes when you don't care, then you don't deal with it with dignity. You don't deal with it kindly. You just say, man, what a waste of time. Why would I want to talk about that? Choose to care. That's, that's really another definition of compassion. Compassion is not so much you making sure they know how you feel about things. Compassion is you finding out what they feel and how you can serve them, how you can minister to them. Marriage should be made up of two people doing just that very thing. That's what it means to be one flesh again. When you get close to that person, you begin to become aware of what bothers them, what hurts them, what concerns them. And so you can come alongside because they've opened up to you, and you can say, what can I do to help? How can I minister to you in this time? And, and it'll be different for, for different people. But this is so important there. Philippians 2, verse 4, nails it. Don't just think about your own affairs, but be interested in others too and in what they are doing. That's God speaking. It says take the initiative and find out what bothers them and see if there's anything you can do to help. And there may not be anything you can do to help other than just be there. But, it's, but you need to take the initiative to do that. How about Galatians 5 verse 13? For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but... Through love, serve one another. God has freed you up. Those of you who have received Christ and received the gift of life that he gave, you are free not to do whatever you want. You're free now to serve your spouse. You're free to be there to lift her up or him up. You're, there to, you're free to walk with them and do life together. That's what he's saying here. How about 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11? Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another. I mean, God is just laying it out there saying, it's no ifs, ands, buts around. He says, this is, I want you to be about this. And, and then, then he nails it. He brings it all together with Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. God says in his word, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Why don't we substitute that one another to wife or husband? Bear your wife's burdens. Bear your husband's burdens. And therefore, you will fulfill the law of Christ. It applies. It applies. It's much broader than that, but it certainly nails us where we are. We, we need to be concerned about them. It, it's, 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 it's sort of like um, we have to be willing to say no to self in order to say yes to our spouse. If I'm sitting there in, in the living room watching a ball game, a, it doesn't matter, basketball, football game, I love college sports, and I'm watching there, and then Cindy comes in the door and says, I just went to the grocery store, can you help me out here? It's the it's the last quarter, two minutes to go in the end of the game. The score is, is six to six, and my team's got the ball going down. Honey, can you help me with the groceries? And of course, I'm going to say to her, of course. As a matter of fact, would you sit here and watch the end of this game for me so while I get in and let me know how it happened? <laughs> my wife is here. She would say, he has never done that. <laughs> but, but somewhere in between, that's where we ought to be. Okay, you got the groceries. Listen, just close the door. It'll stay cool in there for a while. And then when the game's over, I'll go get it. Now, you may have to compromise that a little bit. She may not think so, not with the ice cream, you know, which would be in there melting. So, but, or you could just say, you know, you could actually take the remote control and hit record or pause and then go do it and come back. I mean, is your marriage worth changing you? Yes. Our issue is we just know what we want, when we want it, and how we want it. And, and you're coming here and trying to tell me that I don't need that right now. Wait a minute. Right? And God says it's an issue of self. It's of the flesh versus the spirit. And God says your marriage will be much better if you learn to be concerned about what your wife and your husband is concerned about. 
Um, it's funny, I came across this um, article entitled The Evolution of Compassion in a Marriage, and it talks about the digression, that it gets how the emotions just get worse and worse and worse the longer you're married. Here's, let me give you the example. The first stage happens the first year, and, and the guy says to his wife, baby darling, I'm worried about that sniffle you have, so I've called the paramedic to rush you to the hospital for a checkup and a week of rest. And I know you don't like hospital food, so I'm having the meals brought in. That's year one. Year two. Sweetheart, I don't like the sound of that cough. I've arranged for Dr. Johnson to make a house call. Let me tuck you in bed right now. Year three. You look like you got a fever. Why don't you drive yourself over to the pharmacy and get some medicine? I'll watch the kids. Fourth year. Look, be sensible. After you've fed and bathed the kids and washed the dishes, you really ought to go to bed. And then the last year, fifth year. For Pete's sake, do you have to cough so loud? I can't hear the television. Would you mind going into another room where, while this show is on? You sound like a barking dog. <laughs> now, I know none of you would ever say anything like that. But you, you can see the tendency of the flesh to move in that direction if you don't guard yourself. God says, I want you to have empathy and compassion for each other. And it may go directly against your agenda. And God says, well, then change the agenda because I made her for you and I made him for you. Now it brings me to number three, the third secret. Appreciate and accept your differences. You are different for a reason. God made you that way. You were raised in two different families. You learned life differently than your spouse did. And that's what God is saying here. I want you to know, not to see it as a curse. It's no reason for you to sit back and say, man, I just, I just married the wrong person. That, that is not what God wants you to get from this. He says you're very different from each other for a reason. And that's why I've created you to be able to come together as one flesh. Who totally complement each other. That's God saying, I want you to know that I'm all about the differences. Listen to this, Genesis 2.18. I've, I've read this already, but I want you to hear it again. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone, so I'll make for him a helper suitable for him. So God knows ahead of time what you're going to do, what you're going to go through in life, and he knows exactly the kind of partner you're going to need to make it through life with satisfaction. And that's what he's saying here, treasure the differences. Um, Proverbs 18, verse 22. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. You need to tell her that. You're a good thing that happened in my life. Or how about this, Ephesians 4. It starts off by saying, you know, walk in a manner worthy of the calling, and the calling would include your life with your spouse. But then he goes on in verse 2 and says, And mark that you do this with humility and discipline, not in fits and starts, but steadily pouring yourself out for each other in acts of love, alert at noticing differences and quick at mending fences. God says, I, I want you to thank me for the differences, not run from them. But we are different, you know that. We had a couple here uh, a number of years ago, led in a marriage retreat. And they, they said, we see men and women, husbands and wives, this way. Men are like waffles and women are like spaghetti. And, and, it's, and it's so true. Because when you're talking to a guy, he's jumped in one of the boxes of the waffle. And he's very focused. And he's able to talk about that. It might be the sports box now that he's watching and all that. And you try to talk to him in there and he gets confused. Because you're bringing up other things that he's not prepared for. So he said, hold on a minute. He crawls into another box so he can understand what you're talking about. And then you jump back into the other box. And he goes to, he finds, and that's why it's so hard for him to, to multitask in his hearing. He's just like this. But then ladies, they're, they think like spaghetti. Everything is touching. And so you can talk to them about anything, everything. And they, oh, they're right there with you. Whereas the guy say, what are you, what, where did that come from? How, how did you, what, what's, what are you trying to say? I don't get the connection here. Because we're waffles. And ladies are spaghetti. I, there's a lot of, I and mean, obviously I'm typecasting, but understand not everybody's like that, but there's a good number of guys who are like that that are nodding their head and saying, that's me, all right. Because that is. There's another example. It's, I think it's always helpful to find other examples that, that relate to us. There was a book that was written 20, 30 years ago by John Gray. The title of the book was Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. And I, I just, I love the way he opens it up. Let me read to you the first paragraph, and you'll get it. 
It says, imagine that men are from Mars and women are from Venus. One day, long ago, the Martians looked through their telescopes and they discovered the Venusians. They fell in love and quickly invented space travel and flew to Venus. The Venusians welcomed the Martians with open arms and then they decided to fly to Earth. In the beginning, of everything, in the beginning everything was wonderful and beautiful, but the effects of the Earth's atmosphere took hold. And one morning everyone woke up with a peculiar kind of amnesia. Both the Martians and the Venusians forgot that they were from different planets and were supposed to be different. And since that day, men and women have been in conflict. And then the rest of the book is talking about highlighting the differences. It's helpful to know that. Rather than run from the differences, embrace it. Remember, God gives you somebody that compliments you. Sometimes in, in fitting her, her or him to you, it, it, it involves pain. It's like sandpaper. You know, rubbing your mouth or rubbing your leg is off. But using your, your partner to do that. But God said, that's a good thing. The, she's different for a reason. It's a good reason. It's, it benefits you. He's different for a reason. Benefits you. Now that brings me to the fourth secret. Enjoy and romance your spouse. Enjoy and romance your spouse. And when I'm talking about romance here, I, I'm talking about the ultimate, the epitome of the one flesh picture. One flesh obviously involves the, the physical facet, but it involves every other part. It's about you being tender-hearted toward the person. What one flesh means that you, you long to be around that person. It's, it's, it's someone that you say, hey, if I had it to do all over again, I'd still pick you. I mean, it's that mindset. That's what we're talking about here. So you, you want to treat a person tenderly, you want to be thoughtful, you want to be grateful, all of those characteristics fit into this enjoying and romancing your spouse. Now what does the Bible say? The Bible has much to say about this. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 9, live happily with the woman you love through the fleeting days of life for the wife God gives you is your best reward down here for all your earthly toil. You, wow, the best reward. Proverbs 31, verse 10. An excellent wife, who can find? For her worth is far above jewels. And God is saying, and guys, don't miss this. Proverbs 5, verse 18. Be happy with the wife you married when you were young. She is beautiful and graceful, just like a deer. You should be attracted to her and stay deeply in love. I mean, we, we need to be tender like that. We, we need to be willing to write cards to express that, that love that we have for each other. We, we need to be willing to get on the, line, on the phone or text <clears throat> a person that, that we've married and say, hey, I just want you to know I was thinking about you. I appreciate you. I love you. Thanks for, and you fill in the blank. It's, it, but physically, there's those times when you just need to sit next to each other and hold hands. You need to snuggle with each other and just sit there. You just need to enjoy each other's company. Put an arm around her. Give him a kiss or a hug. That, and that reminds me of the guy. There was a guy who was concerned about his wife. <clears throat> there, and his wife was depressed. And so he says, man, we need to go see a, a psychiatrist or somebody. So they go to the psychiatrist. The psychiatrist checks, her, checks him out and says, listen uh, to the man. Uh, would you step out for just a minute so I can talk to your wife privately for a moment? Oh, sure. Anything that will help my wife. So he walks out. And he talks to the woman a little bit more. And it became very uh, apparent that she just is lacking affection from her husband. So he brings the guy in. And the psychiatrist says, I think we found the problem. And so the psychiatrist walks directly over to the man's wife, gives her a big hug and kiss. And then looks at the guy and says, she needs this every day of the week. And the guy who doesn't have a clue says, but I can only bring her here Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. <laughs> Affection. God says, I want you to show it. You know, it's not, don't give it away like that, okay? Number five, the fifth secret of a satisfying marriage is this. Regularly renew your commitment to each other. Again, that's, you say to her, you say to him, if I had it to do all over again, I'd still want to be with you. That's renewing your commitment. It's, it's your way of saying, I'm here for the long haul. I mean, that's, that's Mark 10 again, verse 6. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh, so that they are no longer two, but one flesh. And what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Don't try to put a wedge between something I have blessed. 
I, I, this is for a long-term commitment. See, marriage is a man and a woman coming together, making promises to each other, entering into a covenant that would last a lifetime. That's God's definition of marriage. And he says, and when you live in that way and you move in that direction and you work hard at maintaining that, then God says you're going to experience the best marriage you could ever have. But it flies in the face of a lot of things. Like, you know the old adage, uh, the grass is greener on the other side. But that, you know that's not true. The grass is greener where you water it. And that's true in your marriage. I mean, there's some, some folks, well, I, you know, I just can't put up with her or put up with her, him anymore because <clears throat> just, we're just incompatible. Well, frankly, I don't know anybody who's not incompatible with everybody at times. There are just some times when we are selfish, self-centered, and there's not anybody who'd be compatible with us in a moment like that. So that's not a good reason to run. Just know that this is a good a moment for you to grow. <laughs> and it may be tough. But God says, but I, I'm going to be there for you, with you. And you, you just, you never, you, you want to throw out the word divorce. Just chunk it. Get rid Never to consider it. Because once it's there, it just kind of hangs there. And Satan just loves to throw it in your face anytime anything wrong goes on. God says, I, I want you to stick it out. In fact, I, I, I want us to, to apply this principle right now. If you are in this room and you are with your spouse, I want you to stand up right now because we're going to pray for you. Just stand up where you are. If you can. If you can't stand up, stay in the chair. But just, Okay, you got your husband and wife right there, right? Now what I want you to do is I want you to turn and face your spouse. And I want you to, t to hold their hands in there. And the ones around you are praying for you and they're, they're monitoring to make sure you're holding their hand. Okay? Okay, you got that? Now, I happen to have some wedding vows here that I use when I conduct wedding ceremonies. And this is your opportunity to remind your wife, remind your husband that you love them and that you're planning to spend the rest of your days with them. All right? And I, might, I, I would say I, my wife is somewhere over here. Is she around? Okay, come on over here, hon. <laughs> here we go. Here, I'm going to come on. All right, now, I'm going to read these vows to you. And when I read them, I'm going to be putting my name and Cindy's name in it. But when you say it, you put your names in it, okay? So you're not marrying her. I'm not giving her up. <laughs> All right, so you ready? Guys, you go first. I, Mike, take you, Cindy. To be my wedded wife. To have and to hold from this day forward. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish until death do us part. Good job, guys. All right, now, ladies, repeat after me and remember, use your names. <laughs> I, Cindy, take you, Mike. I, Cindy, take you, Mike. To be my wedded husband. To be my wedded husband. To have and to hold. From this, day forward. from this day forward, for better for worse, for, better, for, worse. for, richer, or poorer. for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, in sickness and in health. To, love and to, cherish. to love and to cherish until death do us part. Well, based upon your commitments to each other and doing that in the presence of others, I repronounce you husband and wife. <laughs> and guys, you may now kiss your bride. <laughs> You did that like you know what you're doing. That's good. We need to do things like that periodically just to remind ourselves how important our spouse really is and remind ourselves of the importance of the commitment we've made. All right, I got two more secrets, and they're very close to each other, but they're very different from each other. But I want to end with these two. Num number six is this go on mission trips together. Go on mission trips together. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about any kind of project. It could be something local. It could be doing something just for a neighbor. But to just to go outside of yourself and you, the both of you, do something together that would result in the giving away of something. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Genesis 2, verse 18 again. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a what? 
helper. And so what God is saying is that you, you're going to be given a task. You're, you're given this task to take care of the world, but there's going to be specific tasks. He says, and you're going to need some help. And so I have given you your helper. So the two of you need to put your heads together and figure out how you're going to get this project done. Anytime you do that, you're building and strengthening your marriage. You're letting each other know how valuable each other is in the context of being product productive. That's what this is about. How about this? Philippians 2, verse 2. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, and intent on one purpose. That's a description of a mission project. Now, we think when we say mission trips, we're thinking, oh, they're going overseas to China or they're going to Arkansas. It's much more than that. It's every day of your life. What are you going to take your wife and your husband alongside and say, what can we do to benefit our neighbors? What can we do to benefit the people we work with? What can we do to benefit that person who just had a baby? Maybe we can prepare a meal for them and do this. See, that's a mission trip. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, 4. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. This applies to married couples as well as everybody else. But God says you need to be encouraging each other to, to get involved in the lives of others. He says, not forsaking our own assembling together is the habit of some, so don't do it at the expense of the other, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. There's just so many things you could do here. People invested in my life. I'm not where I am because I did my own thing. I had people who poured their life into me and my wife. And you could do the same thing. Look for a couple. You that just renewed your wedding vows. Look for a young couple and come alongside them and just spend a little time with them so, so maybe they can learn the lessons that you've had to learn the hard way without having to experience it like you did. I mean, we can help each other there. And then that brings me to the seventh secret. Choose to grow spiritually together. Choose to grow spiritually together. I told you the one flesh concept includes everything. And God is not leaving out the, the dimension that says, here's how you relate to God. God wants you to have a personal, intimate relationship with him. He's not going to force his way on you. But he will do everything necessary for you to enter into that kind of relationship should you choose to exercise your faith that way. Jesus came to this earth loving you. The Father sent his only begotten son to die for you and me. Why? Because the Bible says the wages of our sin is death. We have to die because of our sin. So one of these days, every one of us is going to die and we're going to pay for our sins. Unless somebody else who is innocent, guiltless, sinless, steps in and says, I'm going to die in your place because I love you. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus stepped out of heaven, became a man, so that he could one day lay down his life and say, I love you too much to let you go down that road by yourself. He says, I'm going to lay down my life and die for you. And then on the, after he died on that cross, on the third day he rose again from the dead, and he says, I'm alive and I now offer you forgiveness and a second chance in life. Salvation. He says, will you receive it by faith? And then it's in your lap. When it comes to marriage, it's not unusual that one of the people in the marriage is, uh, has ex exercised their faith in Christ and received Christ, and they are a different person. It's very caught. I find a lot of people who, when they're married, one has the gift of life, eternal life, and the other one doesn't. There's always an impasse there. The Bible talks about not being unequally yoked. Why? Because it tears you down. It confuses. But you are who you are right now in the situation you're at. And if one of you is not, then I want to, I want to challenge the, the one of you who have yet to take that step of faith. You've heard your wife talk about it before. You've heard your husband talk about it before. And you just kind of say, well, I need more time to think about it. Well, it's time to stop thinking about it. It's time to act on it. To just apply your faith and say, I accept your free gift that you paid for me. I don't deserve it but I accept it by faith. Please come into my life too, like he went and came into her life or his life. Now's the time to do that. You don't have to put it off any longer. And when you do it, I promise you, God always honors his word. He says you become a brand new creation. The old things are gone. Behold, everything becomes brand new if you choose to accept his offer, his offer of forgiveness. You ready? Now's the moment to do that. You won't regret it. And watch what happens into your marriage. I don't want you to be blindsided by this.
But when you receive Christ, in the first moments are going to be wonderful, breathtaking, if you will, until you start to apply that life. And then you're still going to have rubs with each other. Conflict comes with the territory. Doesn't mean that they didn't work. It just means that God's going to use that spouse of yours as sandpaper. They did before. God's not changed his methods. God's not changed his desires. He, he still wants you to come together as one. And he's going to do everything in his power to make sure that you complement each other. He says, whether you're a Christian or not, he's going to do that. But God says, I want you to be on the same page spiritually. I want you to receive the gift of eternal life. If you're ready to do that right now, I want, I want you to do it as I pray. In fact, this is, everybody bow your heads right now. Nobody's looking around. If you're ready to open up your heart and by faith just accept Christ, then pray something like this. Dear God, I'm ready. I've put it off for too long and now I want to do that. I believe, Jesus, you died on the cross for me in my place to pay for my sin. And I believe that you were in the tomb three days and you rose again from the dead and now you're offering me forgiveness of my sin and a brand new life, a new start. I want to take you up on that offer. I want to be the best husband or wife I can possibly be. And I know I can't be if I leave you out of my life. So I invite you to come into my life and change me. Make me more like what you intended from the beginning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now look up here for a moment. If you prayed that prayer with me just then, you need to know that God heard every word and God responded. Because he says in the word, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, rescued. That's his promise. He's just waiting for you. And so I invite you, please, to, to follow that up. In just a minute, we're going to close the service. And I, I, I and a couple of our pastors are going to be right down here at the front. If you're online, why don't you just call our church office right now or type a message that says, I need to talk to somebody, and we'll get back, some, get some back to you immediately. But, but they'll be right up here, and I'd love for you to come so we can tell you what's next, how this new life can impact your marriage positively, how it will enable you to experience a satisfying marriage. You want to do that. I promise you, you do. Now listen, marriage is one of those institutions that God ordained, invented. It's his idea. But Satan will do what he can to destroy it, especially yours. So you need to be on the alert. You need to wear the armor of God like the kids were talking about. You need to deal with these, these, these thoughts about marriage that are, defy God's definition with the truth. Come back and say, here's what God says the truth is. Go back to Mark chapter 10. Go back to Genesis chapter 2 and say, this is what God says. And I may not feel like that, but that's what God says, so I better fit into his plan. You, you want to do that, I promise you. So in just a moment, I'm going to dismiss this. Go tell somebody that message. There's people that are miserable, that wishing there was a different message to be shared in the context of marriage. Go tell them that God loves them and God wants to do something in their life that will change them. You tell them that. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you for your desire and your intentions for our marriage. Thank you, Lord, that you are in the business of creating one who perfectly complements us. Thank you for that. We love you. We know you love us. Now, Father, take these commitments that are just made a moment ago and, and use them in their lives to propel them forward to experience the newness of life in Christ Jesus. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you all. You're dismissed. Go tell someone about Jesus. <laughs>